This video is likely to be demonetized because of the sensitive topic. So if you want to support our journalistic independence, please consider backing us on Patreon or donating through PayPal. Both are linked down below. So yesterday, Sudan's Prime Minister was put under house arrest by Sudanese soldiers as part of a military coup, marking the fourth military coup that Africa's had this year and the second in Sudan since 2019. It could also mean the end of political stability in the Horn of Africa. So in this video, we're going to be looking at how the coup happened, what it might mean for Sudan and what consequences it might have for the region more generally. To understand this story, you have to go back to the previous leader of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. Al-Bashir was a colonel in the Sudanese army who came to power in 1989 after successfully ousting the democratically elected government in a military coup. Al-Bashir was kind of your boilerplate totalitarian. He disbanded other political parties, introduced a version of Sharia law in North Sudan, and waged a civil war against ethnic Darfuri people in Darfur, a region in West Sudan. In 2019, the International Criminal Court even indicted him on five counts of crimes against humanity and two counts of war crimes. Then in 2010, the ICC issued a second indictment, this time for genocide. The first time the ICC ever issued an indictment for genocide. We're not going to go into too much detail here, because this video isn't about al-Bashir. But the basic idea is that he was much more than just a dodgy fella. And in 2019, he was finally overthrown by, well, another military coup. The culmination of five months of popular protests against al-Bashir. The new military junta, known as the TMC, were essentially led by the Janjaweed, an Arab militia from Western Sudan who themselves have been accused of various war crimes against the African Sudanese Darfur. Unsurprisingly then, they weren't much better than al-Bashir, and in June they killed more than a hundred civilians in a major massacre. In response, pro-democracy opposition gangs represented by the Forces for Freedom and Change, or FFC, called for a three-day general strike and civil disobedience until the TMC stepped down. This apparently worked, and in September 2019, the TMC and FFC signed a draft constitutional agreement, which basically said that Saddam would be ruled by an 11-member sovereignty council, made up of both military and civilian leaders. The Sovereignty Council would be chaired by someone from the military for the first 21 months and then a civilian would take over for the next eight, when elections would finally be held. It took a few months to stabilise the country, but once it had calmed down, the Sovereign Council agreed to hand some power over to civilians sometime in mid-November 2021. While the constitution did provide for a new government, led by Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok and his cabinet, since the constitution was actually agreed, Sudan has basically still been ruled by the Sovereign Council and its military leader, Lieutenant General Abdul Fattah al-Burhan. Al-Burhan sits in the presidential palace, receives foreign visitors and decides on Sudan's domestic and foreign policy. And as the mid-November deadline approached, Al-Bahan and his military allies were clearly not keen on giving up power anytime soon and started acting up. So in early October, Al-Bahan demanded that the civilian government be dissolved and the TMC's deputy leader claimed that civilian politicians were acting selfishly and said that the military would take to the streets if needed. Right on cue, on Saturday 17th of October, there were protests calling for the military to dissolve the civilian government and take control once again. This might sound like the people of Sudan wanted a return to military rule, but in reality, the protests were probably facilitated, if not orchestrated, by the military, so that when they did indeed go ahead with the coup, they could claim that they enjoyed popular support. That's not to say that the Sudanese people don't have real grievances with their pro-democracy representatives. The FFC has suffered from endless factional infighting, while Hamdok's government have cut fuel subsidies, inflation has hit 400% and the national debt is projected to balloon sixfold to $1.2 trillion by 2025. But that doesn't mean that the public are pro-military either. Basically, there's no obvious competent political leadership in the country. But the solution to that probably isn't another military coup. And the Sudanese seem to know that. 
because just four days later, on October 21st, pro-democracy groups held an even larger counter-demonstration in favour of the civilian government. Tens of thousands of pro-democracy protesters gathered until the military had to use tear gas to disperse them. Nonetheless, these pro-democracy protests apparently weren't enough, because on Monday, the military decided to go ahead and get rid of the civilian government anyway. Soldiers stormed the homes of the Prime Minister, various cabinet members, and at least one civilian member of the Sovereign Council, and placed them under house arrest or moved them to unknown locations. The military also stormed radio and television headquarters, and according to NetBlocks, internet access was also restricted. The military then closed the airport and blocked the main roads in and out of the capital, restricting both transport and civilian movement in and out. Al Burhan then gave a televised speech, in which he said he was dissolving Hamdok's traditional government and the Sovereign Council, both of which will be replaced by the military until the July 2023 elections, as promised by the constitution. Al Burhan also triggered a state of emergency, paving the way for more invasive changes to the constitution. In response, pro-democracy protesters gathered outside the presidential palace on Monday and Tuesday, and the military fired live rounds at them, killing at least 10 protesters. Again, it's hard to get good data on this because the internet's down, but the basic idea is that the military is basically firing on pro-democracy protesters. So what happens now? Well, as you can imagine, the international community has denounced the coup. The African Union has even suspended Sudan's membership and called for the release of all protesters, with the US also decrying the coup and pausing all funding to the country. Additionally, the UN Security Council has scheduled an emergency meeting to discuss the issue today. But it's not obvious what the international community can actually do to help. We don't want to sound too pessimistic, but Sudan has really struggled with its transition to democracy. Sudan's ethnic groups have been embroiled in a civil war with one another, on and off, since independence in 1956, and it's hard to get them all to put down their weapons and coexist in a peaceful democracy. This is why in the 70-odd years since independence, Sudan has been a democracy for a total of just seven from 1956 to 1958, and then from 1964 to 1969. And in that time, Sudan has endured a staggering 16 attempted coups, the third most in the world after Bolivia and Argentina. The point is that while we don't want to seem too pessimistic, history suggests that Sudan isn't likely to become a functioning democracy anytime soon. But comment your thoughts on the situation and what you think will happen next down below. If you want to get even more involved, you can also back us on Patreon, which gets you a whole load of perks, from exclusive live streams to early access to videos, behind the scenes posts, and the ability to choose our video topics. The link to the Patreon is down below. And thanks for your support, because we literally couldn't do it without you. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.